Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, Zara, can I just check the recording's going okay? Yes. Yes, fantastic. Right, we're off then. Um, so my name's Susan Murray um, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this discussion today. Um, I'm director of the David Hume Institute, which is a think tank um, uh, established in 1985 and we're based in Scotland. We carry out research and host public events on a range of issues related to the economy and society in Scotland. For today's webinar, we'll explore the 2023 Edelman Global Trust Barometer and our recently launched discussion paper with Charlie Woods, Is Trust an Undervalued Ingredient for a Thriving Economy? We will reflect on the value of trust and what its impact could mean for the Scottish economy and the labour market. Now, before I hand over to our panel, I'd just like to cover a few things about how the event will work. We're recording the session and it will be uploaded to our website afterwards. There's closed captioning enabled and the button to switch that on can be found at the bottom of your Zoom window, window if you'd like to use that. The chat function has been left open so you can use that to introduce yourself and uh, raise any points you'd like to make as the speakers go through. Um, we've also got the Q&A function open so if you'd like to ask a question of the speaker please use the Q&A section um, and then what I'll do is I'll select the questions from the Q&A. Um, if you can't ask your question in person um, because what we like to do is put the allow people to ask their questions in their own voice um, so we if you can't unmute yourself then um, please do let us know and I'll ask the question for you. Um, so we'll head off with a roughly around 15 to 20 minutes of speaker conversation and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So please do get ready to ask your questions because the hour goes very quickly together and I'd hate to miss out on, on your question. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Firstly, joining us all the way from the United States of America is Dr. David Bursoff. David is the head of research for the Edelman Trust Institute. He leads all of Edelman's trust oriented thought leadership, including the Edelman Trust Barometer. Prior to joining Edelman in 2016, David spent 18 years in, as a consumer insights and marketing strategy consultant at the Futures Company. In addition, David has also served, served as a trusted advisor and a brand strategy consultant to major clients in industries as diverse as financial services, automotive, media and professional organizations, energy and the military. So David will be followed by Charlie Woods, who is author of the David Hume Institute's discussion paper, Is Trust an Undervalued Ingredient for a Thriving Economy? Charlie was previously Director of Strategy and Chief Economist at Scottish Enterprise, and is now an Executive Director of the Scottish University's Insight Institute and Vice Chair of the Economic Development Association for Scotland. Charlie is also an associate of Core Solutions and has extensive mediation and facilitation experience in a wide range of fields, including planning, family business, management, PPP contracts, uh, transport infrastructure, government policy and professional services. And Charlie will be followed by John Sturrock. John is founder and a senior mediator at Core Solutions. For over 20 years, he's been a pioneer for me mediation in the UK and with an international reputation his work extends to commercial, commercial, professional, sports, public sector, policy, and political fields. He is identified as a global elite thought leader by Who's Who Legal and a dis distinguished fellow of the International Academy of Mediators. He's been a visiting professor at the University of Edinburgh. He writes extensively and has recently published a second volume of his book entitled A Mediator's Musing. Both volumes are available on Amazon, he assures us, if you'd like to read them afterwards. So. Um, as was said before, please do get your questions in the Q&A box and we'll come to you once we've heard from the speakers. Now, without further ado, over to David. Okay, just want to make sure everything's okay. Good. All right, so let me jump right in. So my task here today is talk about sort of trust the big picture. And I want to start very big with the basics. So in modern society, we delegate important aspects of our well being to our institutions. So, for example, to business sector, we delegate our economic well being, our financial security. To government, we delegate keeping us he healthy, keeping us safe, making sure society is running fairly. To media, we delegate our information and knowledge needs. We rely on media to give us the information we need to make the best possible life decisions 
And to NGOs, we delegate caring about and addressing those causes and issues that are important to us. Now, in order to feel safe delegating important aspects of your life and well-being to others, one needs to trust them to act with integrity and with your best interests in mind. Now, if trust in these institutions break down, people begin to fear that the things of greatest importance to their well-being are no longer in safe, reliable hands. And this is not a situation that people will tolerate for extended periods of time. As their distrust remains chronically unaddressed, which I think we've seen over the past five to 10 years, their tendency to take extreme action to regain a sense of control and reassurance increases. And oftentimes, I'm afraid, these actions are not actually in their own or anybody else's best interest. So trust is important at the highest level because without it, the fabric of society unravels to the detriment of everyone. And I'm gonna spend my sort of 10 minutes of open remarks to show you exactly what that unraveling is looking like. Uh, trying to get my slides to, there we go. Perhaps the most fundamental trust problem that we face today is that there's two different trust realities based on income. As you can see here, uh, globally in the world, the people who have, whoop, sorry, the people who have um, high or one, the top quarter of, of incomes, 64% of them feel like they can basically trust the institutions and society. That's 40, goes down to 49 among people at the lower levels of income, the bottom quartile. So when you have two segments of the population that are on differing trust trajectories or experiencing different trust realities, they're no longer equally invested in either change or the status quo, which is destabilizing. And I think part of the reason why we've seen um, sort of populist insurgencies in many countries around the world, including, I would argue, the UK. Now, it is likely that this gap is never going to completely go away for the simple reason that the more educated, the more affluent, and the more well-informed will always be in a better position to harvest and enjoy the benefits of the society or to capitalize on the status quo. But that said, the gap can and needs to be closed at least to the point where the top and bottom are not living in two separate realities, such that the well-off are living in a world of trust where they can feel comfortable delegating these things to institutions and the working class is living in a world where institutions are largely untrustworthy. In terms of the situation in the UK, you can see on this chart, the, two, the, the data is highlighted in gray. Um, and you can see that the situation is not quite as bad as what we see globally, but that's only because you're more affluent are relatively less trusting, not because you're less affluent or enjoying a higher level of trust than we see among people in other countries. A second critically important trust dynamic at work in society today is depicted on this slide. So at the Trust Institute, we split trust into two dimensions. Ethics, basically, can you be relied on to do good? Are your motivations good? And competence, do you, can you get it done? Can you get your job done? Do you have the ability to follow through? Of the four institutions we track, government, media, NGOs, and business, only business is seen as both ethical and competent. And in fact, one of the more amazing findings we've seen over the past three years, business ethics score has risen 27 points to where it's now seen as, in general, a more ethical institution than even NGOs. Compare that to government, which is mired in that unethical, less competent quadrant way down at the bottom. So why is this important? Well, a couple of reasons. The first is the lack of trust balance between government and business is a source of instability because you have the regulators being less trusted than the regulated. Also, the lack of trust in government is a catalyst for increasing pressure being placed on business to address thorny societal issues and to fill the leadership gap left by an ineffectual and paralyzed government. And we can see what that looks like here, this is reflected in the data you're seeing here, where overwhelmingly people are more interested or are saying that business is not doing enough when it comes to the big issues of the day. 
energy, healthcare, climate, reskilling, economic inequality versus overstepping. And I would argue that this kind of pressure and expectation on business isn't to this extent, isn't this large, isn't this omnipresent if government is more trusted. Now, unfortunately, must, most of the trust problem we're seeing is a result of what I would consider to be self-inflicted wounds. We ask people to characterize various entities in society as either dividing forces that are pulling, uh, that are, uh, yeah, pulling people apart are unifying forces that are working to bring people together. Now, not surprisingly, hostile foreign governments are seen as one of the worst offenders in terms of attempting to fuel divisions and fomenting intergroup distrust. We expect that. What is surprising is that just behind the plutocrats and our enemies are our government leaders and journalists. Politicians and media figures these days purposely focus on wedge issues to foment distrust between different factions and then use that distrust to demonize opposing voices. This is often manifest in their casting doubt on the very institutions they're a part of as they try to convince people that only that part of the government or only that part of the media they control can be trusted while the other parts are under the sway of liars, traitors, or worse. And of course, doing that tends to undermine people's trust in the institution as a whole. So until these institutional leaders stop trucking in outrage, until they stop essentially feeding on themselves, government and media will not regain trust. And by extension, overall trust in social institutions will remain low, particularly in Western democracies, where what I've been talking about is a major problem. Now, a knock-on result of institutional leaders fomenting distrust in their own institutions and between different groups of people is the disappearance of civility and the weakening of the social fabric. This 66% of people who say that the social fabric in the, that once held the UK together has grown too weak to serve as a foundation for unity and common purpose is in my opinion, one of the most worrisome statistics you're gonna see from me today. And here's why. As the social fabric continues to weaken, the inevitable ideological differences that exist in vital pluralistic societies begin to harden to the point of intractability. We characterize this ideological entrenchment as polarization. Now, as I just mentioned, ideological divisions are a natural part of vital democracies. Different sides arguing it out, reaching some sort of consensus, leads to more thoughtful, more inclusive, and less extreme policies. But problems arise when those divisions become extreme and people lose faith in the ability of their country to work through them. This chart shows the distribution of the 28 markets where we do the trust survey. And we look at these markets across two dimensions. The first is the percent of people who perceive high levels of division in their country on key societal issues. The second is the percent of people who believe those divisions have become entrenched and have lost faith that they can be worked through or overcome. In the bottom left are the less polarized countries. This is where you tend to see the one-party states, the more autocratic governments. In the middle section, we have many developed as well as developing democracies. And we've also identified a little band of countries in this middle zone, sort of indicated by that crosshatching. These are countries we feel are in danger of falling into severe polarization, which is that section up at the top of the chart. Now it's in this sort of danger zone that you'll find the, U uh, the UK, along with Brazil, France, and Japan. Top right, as I said, is the most polarized countries led by Argentina. Now, a key process underlying polarization is identity, I'm sorry, is I ideology becoming identity. Beliefs are often hard to change just in themselves, but when those beliefs become part of how I define my identity, they become extremely difficult to change and ideological differences between people become harder to ignore or to shrug off. If you're not just disagreeing with an idea I have, but sort of undermining how I see myself as a person, it's very hard for me to look past that and see the good in you. In addition, as ideology becomes identity, a process I might say hastened by a weakening social fabric, we begin to engage in what we call ideological seg uh, segregation. 
And you can see the data here that epitomizes this tendency to close ourselves off from those we disagree with. We ask people, how would they feel about or act towards someone who disagreed with them on an issue they thought was really important? As you see, only 25% said that they would help such a person. Only 24% said they'd be willing to share a neighborhood with such a person. Only 21% would have them as a coworker. Now, the irony here, of course, is that co-action, intermingling, and working together are the best and most powerful ways to overcome our differences and strengthen the social fabric, and yet they're the very thing that polarization makes less likely. So we did a regression to kind of understand what the drivers of polarization were, and, and you see that on this slide. The two most powerful uh, drivers of perception that your country is polarized are distrust in government and a lack of shared identity. Here's that trust thing again. Most polarization, uh, according to our data, is based on political differences, political ideological differences. Government being the institution in which political differences are the most likely uh, to play out is in many countries, therefore, the epicenter of polarization. Additionally, differences become entrenched when people can no longer see past those differences to what unites us or what, to what we have in common, whether that be a common set of values, goals, or a shared future. In general, a lack of shared identity makes it very difficult both to trust other people and to refrain from villainizing those who differ from us on issues that we care about. Next in order of importance is feeling that the system is unfair. Feeling othered, left out, overlooked, or dismissed is alienating. Those who see the system as unfair or prejudiced are less invested in the system, more likely to advocate for radical change, and more likely to hold animus towards those who appear to be enjoying disproportionate benefits especially if those people are also denying that there actually are systemic inequalities in society. So these feelings harden hearts, build barriers to cooperation and unity, and a willingness to compromise disappears. That all said, I wanted to leave you with at least one little ray of hope, and that is the employer and the employer-employee relationship, which uh, is in a special position actually to address polarization and to rebuild a common sense of purpose. Overall, the institutional trust picture is very different among people who see their country as having relatively small and easily overcome divisions versus those who feel like their country is polarized. Reflecting our regression results, institutional trust, as you can see over on the left, is high across institutions when people are basically getting along. As you move towards the right, and you see more division and those divisions become more entrenched, uh, trust in institutions goes down. So for example, you see that business uh, goes from 68 to 68 down to something in the 50s. NGOs, government, those go from sort of trusted in the 60s down to distrusted in the 40s and even the 20s. So a completely different trust picture as you get more and more polarized. Um, but you'll see at the same time, the employer manages to stay trusted across all these situations. And this ability for employers to garner trust amid polarization puts employers in a unique position to re-knit the social fabric, to get people to look and work past their differences and to break out of their information silos. And this is what makes labor disputes so worrisome to me. Because to the extent that actions by employers, such as poorly managed layoffs, union busting, ham-handed workplace technology introductions, pay inequality, to the extent that these things are not handled or managed well, and it damages the trust that employees have for their employers and all the advantages that come with it, we are compromising our last best hope for increasing trust in our societal institutions, decreasing polarization, and overcoming the deleterious effects of misinformation. So let me stop there uh, and pass it on to uh, Charlie. Thank you, David, and uh, thank you, Susan, for the, uh, for the opportunity both to uh, contribute a, a, a paper and uh, and also to, to take part in today's discussion that was fascinating david really really interesting 
I just really want to say a few words to sort of build on what I've said in the paper and to, uh, and to talk more about some of the economic aspects of this. As the chart at the beginning of my paper shows, there does appear to be a strong relationship between levels of trust and, and economic performance. It's probably not a one-way cause and effect thing, probably more a, a cumulative self-reinforcing relationship which works both ways. But it begs the question of what makes trust economically important? And at its most fundamental, a high trust society is likely to be more efficient. It's going to have lower transaction costs. It's going to be less need to be constantly checking up on others' actions. And uh, it will help increase productivity as more, as more time can be spent on productive activities. A high trust, more inclusive society is also likely to be more innovative and enterprising if potential innovators and investors feel they'll have a chance to reap the benefits of their efforts. And in their study of why nations fail or succeed, you could have said, uh, Asmoglu and Robinson have highlighted the contrast in economic performance between inclusive trusting societies and extractive rent-seeking places. And in his book, Journey of Humanity, Oded Gaylor makes the observation that while more homogeneous societies are likely to be more trusting, uh, people like us, uh, innovation is often stimulated by social diversity. And this is a really fine balance. And he stresses the importance of measures that enhance pluralism, tolerance, respect for difference, while fostering social cohesion to facilitate diversity and hence improve innovation and productivity. And this is likely to be ever more important given the, uh, the, the, the technological uh, importance in today's economy. <clears throat> a high trust society is also like the higher levels of overall well-being with less fear and anxiety. And the Nordic countries offer some example here, although I think as, as some of David's charts with reference to Sweden demonstrate, they are now facing their challenges as well as societies become more diverse. Another way of thinking about trust and community cohesiveness is as part of the stock of social capital in the country's balance sheet. The work that the Bennett Institute in Cambridge have done on this is, is very interesting. And the stronger the balance sheet, the more attractive a place will be to live, to work and to invest. So trust operates at many levels, at a broad societal level and at a more micro level within between companies and organisations. Very interesting what David was saying there about uh, the, role of, uh, the, the role of employers. And in many respects, companies are the ways of organizing economic activity without the need for contracts for each transaction. So sort of demonstrating the importance of, uh, uh, of, getting, of getting the trust to get rid of those transactions. So the more the companies with more trusting countries tend to perform better. In dealings between companies and organizations, I think it's important that we pay more attention to building deeper and stronger relationships rather than just viewing dealings on a transaction by transaction basis, which very might well help foster a zero sum mindset if you do that. So, and reputation is critical here in building and maintaining trust. Even if you think a transaction will be one off, your reputation from other deals is likely to precede you. Game theory offers some interesting insights as well into the development of relationships and communications and competitive environment. In the classic prisoner's dilemma, the most likely outcome is that both prisoners confess to minimize their potential loss, even though there was a better outcome available if they could have communicated and cooperated with each other. This is sometimes referred to as a, as a Nash equilibrium after uh, John Nash of beautiful mind fame where once both sides have selected the strategy, neither side can benefit independently by changing their choice. And as one obituary of John Nash put it, there's at least one Nash equilibrium lying in wait to trap us in every situation of competition or conflict where the parties are unwilling or unable to communicate. Robert Axelrod's book, in a way, The Evolution of Cooperation takes this a bit further. He, this was built around uh, repeated uh, uh, simulations of the prisoner dilemma game. And, and that work concluded that the most effective strategy to deploy was, and he described it as nice, i.e. don't do the dirty first, provocable, respond if somebody does, forgiving if somebody mends their ways, and clear, be careful that your actions can't be misinterpreted. And as Axel Rob put it, 
The key to doing well lies not in overcoming others, but in eliciting their cooperation. And trust is vital to achieving this. Communication by both word and deed is key to establishing and maintaining this trust and developing a cooperative mindset. And John's gonna say more about this. It's important to realize that a trusting society doesn't need to suppress difference. Indeed, the differences of opinion and approach are important parts of the innovation process. It's more a question of how difference is managed. So effective dialogue rather than combative debate allows greater exploration and understanding of different perspectives, opens up the possibility of finding ways forward that are more positive some in nature. And as the diversity of society grows, we need to pay even more attention to how we can communicate more effectively to, to harness the potential of what Anna Critchlow calls our collective intelligence. The culture of a place develops slowly over time. Trust takes a long time to build, but we can be quickly damaged. And in his new book, The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism, which touches on a number of the things that, uh, uh, that David talked about, Martin Wolf argues, in order to function effectively, both politics and the economy require a substantial degree of honesty, trustworthiness, self-restraint and truthfulness, along with loyalty to shared political, legal and other institutions. Without them, the cycle of mistrust develops and undermines what we systems we take for granted. And he concludes his review of what's currently going wrong with some of the stark observation that hope requires trust, fear doesn't, it just requires an enemy. So in this environment, it's even more incumbent on leaders and influences in all sectors of the economy and politics to play their part in modeling effective behaviors and supporting society's institutions to develop and maintain frameworks to build a more trusting, and that's more innovative and produ productive economy. So over to John, who's gonna look at some of the practicalities and lessons from mediation that can help contribute to this outcome. Thank you very much, Charlie, and to David, and indeed to Susan and the David Hume Institute for this opportunity. Um, I want to, if I may, make this very practical uh, and, and really down to earth. So I'm gonna start with a few quotations from my own work in recent months. It's all about trust, isn't it? Observed my assistant mediator in a mediator lasting just eight hours last week, in which two property investors satisfactorily resolved a long running dispute with their professional advisors. A few weeks further back, I heard this. We have not listened to each other like this forever. This is really difficult having this conversation, but I feel we could now commit to move forward and work together. That day of mediation involved two of the most senior people in a significant public sector service provider in Scotland. Another one. This is the first time anyone has listened to us in 20 years. Nobody has ever acknowledged what we've been through. That was a completely different situation involving serious whistleblowing with serious ramifications for those concerned spanning over nearly 20 years, undermining confidence in a large organisation. Some years ago, Charlie and I were present when the CEO of a construction company leaned over the table and said to his opposite number at the end of a mediation which arose out of a long-running bitter dispute in one of Scotland's largest infrastructure projects. He said this, just as important as the outcome is that we now understand where you're coming from. Another one said, I've never experienced anything as tough as this dispute in my professional career, but I'm glad we met today they completely changed my perception of people like this. They obviously want this finished. I think we can get something sorted. It will be a, re a relief to put this behind us. It was good to actually meet and talk. It was good to actually meet and talk. I wish we'd had this conversation a year ago. That, or a variant of it, is the message that I hear in nearly every mediation I'm involved in. So let's reflect on some of the words we've heard. Conversation, acknowledgement, understanding, perception, listening, actually meeting and talking. Effective dialogue, as Charlie puts it, is so important and yet so often missing in disputes which have become contentious and polarized. And the absence of really effective dialogue means that trust breaks down and mutual suspicion and enmity can fester and become self-reinforcing. So what happened in those mediations? Well, in each, the impartial third party, the mediator, who has no power 
other than to other than the trust that people place in him or her and in the mediation process, create a space and guidance for difficult meetings to take place in which the parties were able to converse, acknowledge, really listen to, and understand each other. Not necessarily agree, because there would always be differences, as Charlie recognizes, but they learned another side of the story. On the wall behind me, you may see a piece of cheese. There are three mice looking at the piece of cheese from different perspectives. Different perspectives or perceptions, discovering what the dispute is really all about, what people really need. There's always more under the surface than meets the eye. The mediation's job is to separate people from the problem and find the common ground that nearly always exists, rather than seeking to overcome the other side by force, to quote Axelrod, to whom Charlie referred. Just as an aside, that overcoming by force is really exemplified in the often fear-based, trust-diminishing adversarial litigation system, with its damaging and frankly very financially costly binary right-wrong win-lose paradigms. By building working relationships and mediation in this way, a modicum of trust is built or perhaps regained. Now, there's much more to this, of course, than that. And, and the key for us as we ponder this today is to reverse engineer the learning from mediation and deploy that learning upstream in economic activity of all sorts. In the building of effective relationships at the outset of any business or other relationship, Charlie once called this human due diligence. Ensuring really good communication throughout, valuing cooperation, and designing effective safety valves, de-escalation, conflict avoidance, or dispute resolution in the in jargon, so that any difficulties can be nipped in the bud. Now, these are what build and sustain trust. Easy to say. It takes time, and it's hard work. And in our frantic world of increasing polarization, these are often the skills competencies and investments which are missing. Arguably, these should be a core aspect of good contracting, risk management, and effective governance. To conclude, generally, it's been estimated that unresolved conflict costs UK business over £30 billion a year, takes up 20% of leadership time, and results in the loss of 370 million working days, with, of course, the resulting loss in productivity. Specifically in that regard, a less commented upon aspect of the Karl Mack ferry fiasco here in Scotland is that relationships among the key stakeholders apparently broke down so badly at a relatively early stage that they could not be in the same room together. Communication was so poor that things came to a complete standstill, no doubt with a complete absence of trust. Had things been dealt with differently back then, who knows how many tens of millions of pounds of wasted public expenditure might have been saved and turned into productive investment. This takes us back to Charlie and the direct link between levels of trust and economic performance. If trust is poor, the outcomes may be at best suboptimal or at worst zero sum. That is simply not affordable in today's financially constrained world. Trust is a must. Thank you. Thanks, John. That was just delightful bringing it back to the title of the event. Um, masterfully done. Um, I, there were a few questions coming in. Uh, there were a few statements that just jumped out to me. And I, I think the bit that Charlie said about hope requires trust and fear requires an enemy that really struck a chord with me of the kind of narrative we're getting out of the UK government at the moment and the whole labour market disputes, which is kind of where the four of us started these conversations, you know, probably a month ago, six weeks ago, before Charlie wrote the paper on the, the economy. Um, it was really kind of, we'd been looking as an institute at the Danish model of flex security a couple of years ago after we did the the, the paper on the labour market in Scotland and the difference there really struck me. It was all about the, the three-way relationship between the individual, the business and, and the, the, the bit of state in, in Denmark and the relationships and the levels of trust were very different. And that was kind of where we started on this journey. Um, Tanya Castells asked a question and I know that Tanya sits on a lot of boards and thinks a lot about trusts of those organizations. Tanya, are you able to unmute and ask that question yourself? We'll just see if she's there. Um, 
And if not, I'm going to also draw in Patrick mm. Ring because he knows a thing or two about this too. Um, uh, mm. Yes, you're there. Mm. Yes, yes, we can hear you, Fantastic. I'm so pleased to have you here. No, oh, delighted. I think it's a really, really important topic. Um, and I suppose my, what my question was, um, was what, what is the impact of, of hybrid working on, on trust? Because I mean, it's a slightly dean question because my view is it, it actually has a detrimental impact, but um, maybe I'm just old fashioned. Who, who wants to answer that? David, do you see anything coming through in differences in different countries with different lay practices going on? So uh, return to work, of course, is a huge topic since the uh, COVID epidemic, epidemic has abated. Uh, and I get this question a lot about what is the impact of return to work? And, and there's certainly, you can't argue with the fact that interacting with people directly is a way to kind of get the, to know them as sort of fully fleshed out person. You're not interacting with them only in the context of what you disagree on, but you're interacting with them more generally. Um, but I do also caution people to understand that remote work is not the same thing as sort of uh, an internet only relationship. That within the context of work, even if we're doing it via Zoom, we're still both sort of uh, moving towards the same goal. We want to get the project done. We want to get the project done well because then we'll get promoted and we'll get bonuses and the company will do better. So some of the, the downside of working remotely is mitigated by the fact that in the context of work, you have groups of people reliant on each other, all working towards the same goal for uh, you know, benefit across the board. So it's not quite as deleterious as you might think to trust. Thanks, David. Anything you want to come in with, uh, Charlie and John? The questions are coming in thick and fast. So, um, yeah, I agree nothing. with David. It's a it's a fairly mixed picture. Probably easier if you've already got a relationship and you're working over Zoom. But even so, I mean, we, we ran some training courses where people came from all walks of life together and quickly built up quite strong relationships over Zoom. So, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. But the jury's out. I think. Thanks, Charlie. There's a question coming from Geraldine Woolley. Ger Geraldine, are you able to unmute? It's specifically for John to do with the justice system. Right, thank you. Yes, um, I sit on a couple of uh, chambers in the uh, first tier tribunal in Scotland. And what we see are quite substantial delays between um, someone putting a case in and we actually get to hear it. Um, there's very few, very few appellants that go for mediation anyway. But what we find when we get to these cases, we're actually often acting more like mediators mm. than judges as such. And I do wonder whether in a situation um, where David was outlining how low trust is in government, whether the delays in the justice system which are often over quite minor details. You know, somebody hasn't mended my roof, um, my council tax is too high. Are those the sorts of things that are undermining trust in government simply through the delays in bringing people together so they can find resolutions? Well, thank you, Geraldine. That's an interesting question, isn't it? It's a great frustration to some of us that in Scotland in particular, we seem to have been fairly slow on the uptake so far as mediation is concerned. In many other jurisdictions, including south of the border, there's a much greater emphasis placed on mediation. And, and certainly it, where mediation can be deployed, it, that ought to make resolution of disputes in the way that you've described uh, much quicker. And I would argue also much more effective in, in a number of different ways. Uh, as to whether delay itself uh, affects trust, I suppose that the, the difficulty with delay is that it undermines confidence in individuals in themselves because of the ongoing unresolved dispute. It would undermine their ability to rebuild relationships with others with whom they're in dispute. And over a long period of time, that can become so damaging as to be perhaps irretrievable. And I suppose, in a sense, the inference in your question is it also undermines confidence in the system because the system is not 
producing what it, it, it should be doing, which is helping people to achieve uh, the resolution of conflict. So I think what I would say, all of our focus, if it can be, should be on earlier resolution of difficult situations, whether they be conflicts, disputes, or other differences in society. And so mediation is just an application of that idea. In a sense, we need to all become better communicators, better negotiators, build better relationships. And all of that then perhaps reduce the need for us to make use of tribunals and courts, which has tended to be the default and, and tends to exacerbate the adversarial nature of, of things, which in itself, of course, diminishes trust. So there's a lot there, Geraldine, to think about. And uh, I no doubt we could talk much longer about it. Thanks, John. We'll go to Liesl McDonald next. Liesl, are you able to um, unmute? Yes, I am. Hello. Apologies, I'm sitting outside. I hope the background noise isn't too much. Uh, I wanted to ask about the blending of roles. I spent the vast majority of the last 20 years uh, based in Asia, and I've just only recently come back to the UK and observe in both the East and Western cultures how people individuals, brands, organizations, and institutions are no longer sitting comfortably within one particular label. So you have people who are business people who are talking about um, saving the world and talking about social issues and consumers are suspicious of those brands and, and, and big companies. You have media owners who are deeply involved in politics, politicians who are deeply involved in business, and it feels like things are less siloed than they used to be. So it's quite hard to actually understand the role and the function of those individuals, public bodies, brands and companies. How do you think that's going to impact trust going forward? Oh, good, good question. David, do you want to take that? And I can see Charlie nodding vigorously as well. OK, sure. Let me let me start. Um, so, yes, you do have um, institutions sort of encroaching on the territory of other institutions. But I think part of that, particularly business getting involved in societal issues and, and issues that might have been under the purview of government is really driven by this discontinuity, by this un, unbalance between trust in and business and trust in and government. Business is not does not relish the idea of getting involved in thorny social issues. They're doing it because they're being pushed to do so by consumers who are considering these kinds of things when they buy, by employees who, who look to the values of the organizations that they want to work for or that they're willing to work for and expect to be able to work in through those institutions to uh, affect change. Even investors are starting to look at what companies are doing in the realm of ESG. All of that are exogenous forces that are working on business to the point where business now really needs to weigh in if they're going to have consumer loyalty, if they're going to win the talent wars, if they're going to attract investments. So it's not it's not happening accidentally and it's not happening out of hubris. It's happening out of necessity. Uh, at least when we think about business getting involved in, in government stuff. Thanks, David. Charlie? Yeah, that's, that's another one where I think there's sort of two sides to this, really. I mean, on the one hand, you know, the, the increased connections, the shared experience, shared perspectives, you know, that must be positive in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, building trust. But then if it slips into conflicts of interest and trying to encourage sort of rent, rent seeking opportunities, then that's going to grow the distrust. So it's a, yeah, I think again, another, another mixed bag, I think. Thanks, Charlie. Um, Patrick, are you able to unmute and ask you a question yourself? Yeah, uh, I've, I've got a, a couple of, of, of questions. Uh, maybe kind of, uh, first of all, kind of related more generally. I'm interested in how uh, the panelists think that businesses can develop employees' ability to engender trust and confidence, taking into account John's comments about talking and you know, listening and so on, you know, that relationship between those those micro individual day to day uh, 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 meetings or, or, or interactions and the notion of institutional trust and how we connect, you know, you connect those two up as, as a business, both in relation to B2B customers, but obviously retail as, as well. And my second 
kind of question if I'm allowed to do that is if more generally, I think David, that this was uh, 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 triggered by, by by your presentation. If we have left trust in institutions as a whole, but need to interact with them on a day to day basis, were, were there any of you findings that you have anything there in relation to uh, uh, what challenges that creates, for example, individuals in terms of, of mental health and and, and well being in terms of your having to interact, but not trusting the institutions you, you are required to interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. You want to go in, in order, Susan? Uh, shall, shall I take the, the first part, if I may, of, of, yeah. of Patrick's question? Uh, you may have noticed, Patrick, that I mentioned three words in my presentation, skills, competencies, and investment. And it seems to me that while um, employers invest enormous amounts of money in technology and hardware, uh, and, and so forth, um, much less tends to be invested in, 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 the, in the competencies and the skills that we're talking about. And so what one would want to see happen, I think, is that any and many and all businesses would spend more time and see the value in spending in money to scale up their staff in the kind of skills that we've been talking about today, listening, asking questions, engaging with others, building relationships. And that would seem to be, a, see, be, seem to be a value in itself worthy of time being spent, because although there's an investment of time and money up front, the return on that would be substantial going forward. Um, I think there's evidence that, that, that show that companies that do this kind of thing are much, obviously much, or, or say obviously, are better to work for and are more economically productive. And I think my, that might also respond to the, the, the second part of that question, but let me just leave it there. Investment in skills and competencies, I think, is really important to enhance the relationship between employers and employees and between employees themselves. And just, just jumping in on, on that before, before David comes in with a more, more general point. Yeah, I mean, I think, and that was what that Harvard work in terms of uh, productivity tended to demonstrate as well. I mean, in a way, it's actually thinking more or as much about the how skills as the what skills. Now, and ten, we tend to focus on the what people do and the skills they have not enough on the how they do it. Thanks. David, do you want to come in? Yeah, I mean, we have some really interesting data that shows that quite explicitly that employees expect their employer to sort of export these skills outside the workplace. So the two things we look at are sort of um, making available good quality information, and helping people have conversations about things they disagree with. And of course, there's disagreements in business all the time. So you have to learn to work with people you disagree with. You have to work through and past those differences. It's a set of skills that does it still exist in business, even while the outside world is polarized. The interesting thing is that when we ask, employees say, you know what? My employer makes good information available to me that's trustworthy. I think they should be doing that more broadly outside of the corporate walls. And I think that businesses should be in a position of, of taking the lessons and skills that they teach their employees in terms of getting along and working together and cooperating and even being able to have tough discussions and export those. It's really this idea that and I go back to the importance of that employer-employee relationship. That's the toehold of trust. That's the toehold of regaining civility and re-knitting together the social fabric. And it works, you know, at some point, trust is not going to be rebuilt by government pulling itself up by its bootstraps. Trust is going to be rebuilt through the actions of thousands of employers all doing the right thing till we reach sort of a critical mass of, of skills and trust. Um, and and so this to me is a critically important relationship. Thank, thanks, to all of you. And um, we've got a hand up from John Hay. John, are you able to unmute and ask your question directly? Can you hear us, John? If not, I'll just start talking. Hi there. And that's it. Can you? <clears throat> we can hear you, John. Fire uh, away. Thank you. So, yeah, I just really appreciate some of the messages here and found the conversation to be really enlightening. So, I mean, I think that the kind of final message there that is kind of coming across to me is that the the efforts are at a, a sort of 
groundswell at, at like an everyday interaction level, as well as kind of organizations making light of that or investing in that relationship between the employee and employer. Um, would you guys say there's anything further that uh, sort of other organizations, um, grassroots levels can engage with to actually make this something that's becoming on the agenda regularly? Thanks, John. Um, so slightly different angle, who, who wants to take that? Well, we'll maybe start um, there. Yeah, I mean, I think, and it actually builds on what David just said. I mean, I think that there is something about this is not not waiting for for someone to sort of do this for, for us, but it is it is actually stimulating demand from a sort of bottom up perspective. You know, that this sort of behaviour is what we expect as citizens of a country, and we would like to see we would like to see more of it. And people will people will. Will respond to that one. One would assume, certainly in a in a political environment. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things we we talk about is um, is the fact that the reward matrix in society has been corrupted. It's been corrupted such that now uh, you know two of or three of the great um, assets, votes, sort of consumer attention and money seem to accrue to, to politicians and media by catering to the extremes and essentially ignoring the middle. And so what you have is that the things that, that keep these institutions going, the things that these institutions want come to them if they essentially foment, if they speak to the more extreme uh, right or left of the political spectrum, and the reward is no longer by catering to the middle. And that's a new thing. It wasn't always like that. Before, it was about how do you capture the meaty middle of the marketplace? How do you get sort of that, that, that moderate mindset? Sometimes it shifts a little right, sometimes it shifts a little left, but it's usually in the middle. And what's happened over time is that now you get the money, you get the attention, you get the votes, by talking to the extremes. And what this does is it rewards behavior where people start essentially whipping people up. And that means getting them upset about issues and social policy and identity politics and any number of things just to keep that, that energy going. And until that gets corrected, it's gonna be really hard to solve some of the bigger problems. And I do think that, that businesses have a role to play there because um, these media properties that are catering to more extreme views, they're still operating based on ad revenue. They're still operating based on uh, businesses using marketing dollars to, to try to reach people. And if businesses started holding media accountable, if they started holding divisive voices accountable, then suddenly the matrix gets repaired and a lot of the things we're seeing in society today no longer happen or no longer happen at such scale. So I do think there's a kind of a fundamental structural problem where we as a society, for some reason, have started rewarding the very behaviors that are gonna to lead to undermining our society and disrupting our democracy. We've basically uh, turned the reward matrix on its head so that the, the potential weaknesses of democracy are now being fully exploited and we're feeling the full consequences of where democracies are vulnerable. If, if I, Susan, could just pick one very specific example, I'll try to make it in a non-politically partisan way. Many people in the United Kingdom are looking to the Labour Party as uh, our next government to try, in the hope that it might try to bring some more stability back into what has become a very polarised country. And yet, the Labour Party has begun what we're told will be a series of, of advertisements in which they're taking quite a radical approach in demonising the present Prime Minister. Now, maybe one took what both Charlie and David are saying, and the general population, including business leaders, said to Keir Starmer, you know what, that's really not acceptable. We really do not want to see that coming from the Labour Party. Maybe that's the kind of thing that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. 
I think that's a really good point. It can, kind of connects back to Patrick's point about um, mental health and the impact of this long term. We've we've talked a bit about em, employer and employee relationship, but the bit that's nagging in my head is the bit that we're seeing um, we're seeing coming through in other research that we're doing and in other surveys, which is there are increasing number of people that don't have an employer employee relationship, either because they're out of the labor market or because they're in more precarious work. And so they don't have the benefits and, and they have a, a very different relationship and a, a much more on the edge of sometimes hopelessness. And, and what does that do? It probably connects more to Patrick's question of, you know, the risk of if you have more people descend into hopelessness, how do you get them out? And what does that mean for, you know, mental health of, of, a, of a nation if, if you have politicians that are continually pushing fear and, and not thinking about actually if we want our economy to thrive, we need to concentrate on building trust and not undermining institutions. And um, we're really fast running to the end of this session. It's been a fascinating lunchtime discussion or, or breakfast for David because it's very early um, over the other side. I should stop saying lunchtime. Um, it's not fair for those joining us um, far from, from, from far fung places. Um, what I want to go around each of you and if you could leave the audience with with a couple of sentences or final thoughts what would be the one thing that you would want them to do personally in their own lives you know if you think that if if all of us need to collectively behave differently and make time to build trust how how would you want us to think about doing that should i come to john first and we'll go in reverse order thanks i think it's easy in an event like this susan to regard it as a kind of a, an academic discussion. And we all find ourselves intellectually stimulated and then we go back to our day-to-day -day lives. Um, and I think there's a real danger in that. So I think what I would say to everybody very simply is, if there's something in this has, has affected you, influenced you, persuaded you that there is action to be taken, then please go and speak to somebody who is influential or who can perhaps take action steps, even at the micro level, even in your own workplace or in your own home, I think it's it's about turning this 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 theory into very, very practical steps. Each one of us can take a step to do something different today and tomorrow, which might just collectively then make a difference in the world as a whole. Thanks, John. Charlie? Yeah, I'm going to um, share a piece of advice that William Muir, a great sort of, uh, mediator, a guru that a lot of us uh, 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 really interested in his work and he was he was saying this is in the context of emails but it applies more widely just before you send an email particularly if it's one where you're letting off steam a wee bit save to draft thanks charlie Gr great advice david sure yeah so in organizations businesses ngos non whatever the skills that we need to function well as a society are there. The ability to work with people you disagree with, to compromise, to get good information, to make good decisions, it's all there. The issue is scale. So if I was to leave any you know, advice, just something that for the listeners to kind of keep in the back of their mind, within the organizations you run or you're a part of, all of the building blocks, all of the skills are there. So when you're looking at that, Think a little bit about how you can export that knowledge, those processes, that culture outside the workplace. Think of how can you scale the success you're having within your organization outside your organization. That over time is going to be a critically important way to sort of repair the problems we're seeing today. Thanks, David. What an excellent note to end on. Um, I'm just going to finish by saying I think my action would be for everyone to come along to more David Hume Institute events, um, partly because it's self-interest, but partly because we have um, such a, a diverse audience coming into conversations from uh, different backgrounds with different ideas and reflecting on um, interesting subjects like the one today. So, so we're actually thinking about how, how do we do this big picture 
thinking beyond our own roles and beyond our own sectors and hear from people that are different from ourselves and that that means making sure that you're going to places where where you're coming across people that are not like you so um yes a please do come. Um, there are many more coming uh, b before summer and also at the other side of the summer recess. So um, if you've not attended before, please do come in person. Um, the events are always as interesting as the conversation around the edges, which sometimes, as, as John said in his talk, it's, it's those relationships that you begin to form that you take with you into other aspects of your life and, and, and work. Um, so thank you very much. It's now um, uh, the end of the event. So I would like to thank all our speakers and the audience for your lovely questions. And uh, please do join us again soon. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.